Good morning, dear saints, and blessed Easter. Welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today is Thursday, April 25th, and you're listening to the program where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Today, the church commemorates the evangelist St. Mark, companion to Peter and writer of the Gospel of Mark. April 25th is the feast day for St. Mark, which reminds us of his role in spreading the Christian faith and, of course, the teachings of Jesus. Now, this morning, we're opening up Proverbs chapter 12, the first half, verses 1 through 14. This set of Proverbs emphasizes the importance of loving knowledge and accepting correction, and these as signs of wisdom. These inspired words of God underscore that righteousness in thought, word, and deed aligns with God's will and leads to a life of peace. The passage highlights that the words of the righteous are life-giving, that their work is fruitful, but the wicked, however, are trapped by their deceit and falsehood, which leads to ruin. Folks, whether you're listening to the program over the air on AM850 in St. Louis, live or on demand at KFUO.org or through the KFUO mobile app, I'm so grateful you're here. You can also listen to the show as a podcast, share it with others. Either way, I'm just so happy that you're joining us this morning as we continue our study of Proverbs now in chapter 12. So settle in, open your hearts and your minds. We're about to begin. Thy Strong Word is graciously supported in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF translates, publishes, and distributes books that are Bible-based, Christ-centered, and Reformation-driven. So when you get time, visit lhfmissions.org to learn more about all the great work they do. And if you have questions or comments about today's show, you can reach out to me. My email is probably the fastest way, pastorboo at gmail.com. Um, you can also call in. That's pretty direct, right? 1-800-730-2727. We get your question or your comment out on the air. You can also just send me a text message if you'd like or a direct message on Facebook. Just search for Phil Boo. Those are three ways that you can get your comments or questions out on the air. And I try to check those regularly throughout the show. Well, getting to uh, the main event, joining us this morning, it's the Reverend Jesse Baker. He is the pastor of Family of Christ Lutheran Church in Holton, Wisconsin. Good morning, Pastor Baker. Welcome back to the show. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me back on. I'm glad to have you back. Now, you have changed congregations, I believe, since we've last talked. You've Uh, left my circuit and gone up to Wisconsin, but if I'm not mistaken, you're still in the Minnesota South District. Is that correct? Yeah, I, they still include us for some reason. I haven't figured that out yet, but one well, of at least two I, Wisconsin congregations. In well, at least I Minnesota. still have you in the in the district. Um, uh, fantastic, <laughs> fan, fantastic pastor. It's great to have him among us. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I, I assume that things have been going well, but uh, how's the honeymoon there in Holton? The honeymoon is uh, holding on, which is always good. <laughs> That's good. So. That's good. Well, I'm sure that they will uh, enjoy your ministry, and you guys will have a lot of growing to do together over, well, however long the Lord wants you there. But I'll tell you what, we have uh, 14 verses to get through. Sounds like not very many, but it's amazing the types of conversations that the Proverbs can spawn. So we don't know where we'll end up today, but we're going to go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. And brother, if you'll lead us in that, I'd appreciate it. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gifts you keep providing of us, especially during this Easter season. We ask as we go into your word in Proverbs that you continue to teach us what it means to be wise, how to be about the ministry you've given us, and how to be a people following after you. Continue to bless us in this opportunity as we talk more about you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we did not get to the very last verse of Proverbs chapter 11 on yesterday's show. And I do want to touch on it just a little bit as we move into 12, which makes sense because, you know, (laughs) how they make these decisions to where to put the chapter dividers sometimes is beyond me. Uh, Sometimes you can sense a shift in tone. Sometimes it's maybe an arbitrary reason. And I bet there are some great reasons. I don't know what they are. But I'll tell you what, we're going to start just one verse back, if that's okay with you. Um, And verse 31 says, If the righteous is repaid on earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner? Now, you can see why I might have wanted to go back to that, because that, I think, can be a very challenging verse to interpret. 
um, which is interesting because there's not a lot of commentary notes on it. So maybe it's obvious to everyone but me. But it says <laughs> if which is which it wouldn't be the first time. But if the righteous is repaid on earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner? Um, I here's what I think. I think that it's pretty straightforward in the sense that the that Solomon here is talking about the fact that when you're righteous and, and God blesses you through the fact that you're doing things according to his will, uh, through perhaps individual blessings for whatever his reasons are. But the point is there are benefits to being righteous. It, it isn't just negative. It isn't just persecution. I, I think sometimes our preaching betrays us when we talk about the reality of persecution but i think sometimes we fail to emphasize the joys of being righteous and so i do believe that god uh uh, knows that it is beneficial for the righteous they end up getting repaid on earth but then it says how much more the wicked and the sinner so this doesn't seem to be talking about future punishments but that even in this life being righteous uh, results in better outcomes than being wicked and sinful. Is there another way you think that we should take it, or what are your thoughts? I, my The thing I always go to, because you see this a lot, everyone's always, I would assume people don't want to tackle it because it's so easy to get in the prosperity gospel of this, but I would probably go the route of, like, the Christian life is defined by peace and contentment and not wickedness and sinfulness. You're You're never satisfied. I think that's the route I would go, mm-hmm. is your righteousness, you're repaid on earth by actually, you know, having a life worth living. It's kind of a verbiage I really like, that you're finally content, you found peace because you found the ultimate source of all these things, and they're they're repaid by always chasing after the wind, as Solomon would say. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, they're... they're... They, their expectations, which he already said, will uh, earlier in this chapter, same chapter, chapter eleven. He said, you know, their expectations uh, won't come to pass, right? You know, they, they, what they're expecting to happen, and I focus mostly on the next life, but certainly in this life too. You know, things don't work the way that they want them to, and I think the struggle is for the Christian, for the for the righteous, to look at that and say. Well, it just seems like so many people who are enemies of God's church and enemies of God's wisdom. And yet they seem to be so successful in this life. And, and, and so I think that's what's coming off the page here is, yes, we don't want to fall into the trap of prosperity gospelists, uh, prosperity evangelists, but, but we also don't want to um, forget the lived experience, which is sometimes when you do things the right way, you end up not getting ahead because the world is built to benefit those who do things the wrong way. Mm-hmm. Well, let's keep on going because I think it's going to enlighten us a little bit about uh, this continuing uh, description between the contrastion, contrastion, that's not a word, contrasting between the righteous and the wicked. Uh, Chapter 12, verse 1. Here we go. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. (laughs) I'm going to pause there. The very first one. I love it. I love it. I love the word stupid there. <laughs> it's just, it seems so undignified for the Bible. Um, you know, foolish, fool. We think of all kinds of ways we might want to translate that. Uh, the Hebrew refers to someone who is brutish. Like a, We don't use that word much anymore either, but like a, a brutish man, someone who's a brute, doesn't have intelligence. Uh, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. <laughs> Take us through that. Yeah. It's so good. So I want to get to stupid first because it stuck out to me, too. I'm like, what? Like, this is not common. I think it's used here, and that's like it. But according to those much wiser than me, it's stupidity that appears as ignorant as the actions of a dumb animal. Mm-hmm. So it always, it's not that hard to go like with sheep on that one. But that's not the point here. But it just, it's not pulling punches, which is really hilarious. But... The truth of that is to contrast loving this discipline and whoever hates it is stupid because discipline is what grows you in a much better and more important way. Because you think of Hebrews, you go to the thing, for, all, for the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, 
but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So it's not like uh, no one sitting there. This is what I always say. This is always my example of this, right? Jesus is on the cross, and he go, the God the Father goes to him, oh, I hope you're happy right now. I hope this is great. It's like, oh, discipline is right. never fun in the moment. For those who have kids, you all know this, right? Uh, it's not fun disciplining your children. It's not the thing. I remember my parents told me that a lot. That's probably a better example, honestly, because surprisingly, pastors are troublemakers when they're young. Um, my parents would say once in a while, this is going to hurt you more than me. And as kids, are like, ah, yeah, right, whatever. But no, it's definitely true. I think time and time again, we've seen that. Like, if you really love isn't letting people do whatever they want. Love is correcting and trying to help you become more and more like Christ. Well, and as I was going to say, one of the things that a previous guest made sure that I kept my mind on, and I am certainly following that, is that it isn't us versus them. You know, this is to us, as you've been saying. You know, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. He who hates reproof is stupid. This isn't saying, look at all those people out there who are stupid. I mean, I guess it could be saying that. But I think the first way we need to take it is, you don't be stupid. <laughs> you reader, yeah. don't be stupid. Don't hate mm-hmm. reproof. You know, love discipline, even though discipline is uncomfortable. Yeah. We, and I think probably every generation might say this about the following and subsequent generations, mm-hmm. but I think there is probably some truth to the fact that over the generations, including my own, this, this desire to not have to endure uncomfortable things has taken over. It's hedonism, right? We don't want to suffer in any way, not even in ways that build us up, not even in ways. Mm -hmm. So, so people won't come and sit in a worship service because it's too much time out of their week, an hour, Yeah. but they'll, but they'll spend three or four hours scroll doom scrolling on Instagram or Facebook, or they'll go to the movies or they'll do any number of things that they think does have value. Um, Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, is sometimes going and say studying the Bible or, or reading all the Psalms or reading all the Proverbs, uh, you know, is all of that every time super uh, exciting and, and engaging? No, it's not. But sometimes, as I tell my confirmands, sometimes even the boring things are really important and beneficial. <laughs> not everything can be a pizza party. Yeah. Yeah, not discipline isn't like a lack of fun, but it's, it's, a, it's an inherent routine that you have to start. I mean, that's kind of the tagline, the army was forever, right? We take boys and we make them men. That's not on accident. There's a discipline to it. I mean, that's what seminary does. It's really good that call day just happened too, right? right you take right. a bunch of whippersnappers and then you make them pastors. It's not a magically you're a form product as you enter the seminary, but the whole point of going to that or going to college for whatever you're going for is so you're molded into the product that you should be. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's, at least at CSL, they talk about it as pastoral formation. I'm sure they do at Fort Wayne, too. And and that's such a great term for it because that's what you're doing. You're being formed into that which God has called you to be or which God will be calling you to be, I suppose, through a congregation. But, yeah, that's yeah. it's that forming process that's so important. And as you and I know intimately well, that forming doesn't stop at seminary either. We continue <laughs> as place, pastors yeah. to have to be disciplined, to have to love knowledge. And frankly, and frankly, and this is a struggle, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest right here on the air, I, who likes reproof? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> and, and, and so, but, but he who hates reproof is stupid. I feel like the word there is a little stronger than just like, if it makes you uncomfortable for someone to disagree with you or correct you, you're stupid. Well, no, because who doesn't feel uncomfortable? I, I'm even yeah. to the point where I have to encourage people sometimes, all right, like, I want you to come to me if I've done something wrong. But if I'm a little bit defensive, please just bear with this sinner just for a minute. Let me be a little defensive, and then I'll, I promise yeah. I'll get over it, and I'll think about it. Because that's just like yeah. human nature to say, mm-hmm. to be a little defensive as opposed to be reflective. But that's not hating reproof. That's just struggling with it as anybody does. I think someone who hates reproof, the stupid person, the brutish man, that's someone who just says, I'm going to forsake all discipline. I'm not going to endure 
any correction. No one's above me. You're not my boss. You're not my mom. That kind of that kind of ideology yeah. that people have in this world. And it's and you watch it and you see the way that people interact with authority, with the police, mm-hmm. with teachers. Um, you can see where this has taken hold. People hating reproof. Yeah, yeah. Because I I am God and I am always right. Don't you dare tell me otherwise. Yeah, well, and that's 100%. what it boils down to. People will rarely say it like that, but isn't that exactly what they're saying, right? That I'm the only one that gets yeah. to decide what's true. Yeah. Well, let's move on. You, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go. We'll All right. Go. So uh, Proverbs 2, a good man obtains favor from Yahweh, but a man of evil devices he condemns. No one is established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous will never be moved. All right. So that's two and three. So a good man obtains or finds, grasps, takes, right, obtains favor from Yahweh, but a man of evil. Uh, you know, we're not super excited about talking about good people as Lutherans, but here we have the word a good man. Uh, yeah. What's it referring to or who's it referring to? Is it? Is it I mean, us? obviously, we can we can just run to Jesus. That's that's the easy. <laughs> well, we are good Lutherans, right? <laughs> I, I don't I don't think that's just it. I think legitimately, I mean, we all know these people, right? Men who are men or women in the faith who set an example of what it looks like to be like Christ. My favorite thing now is the memes of uh, Jesus as the line "Imitate me." Paul says, "Imitate me." It's you know, it's, a, <laughs> it's Mufasa. And then there's like the really dopey looking line. It's like, that's us. It's like, yep, that's, yes, yes, that's I've exactly seen that what it is. Yeah, <laughs> it's so true. That's the point. It's like you you are being formed into being a good person, and it's okay. Like that's the whole point of where sanctification, sanctification leads us. We are to be more like that. We are to becoming more and more holy, and that means we're good. That's why we're never there, obviously. We're never going to get there, but that's the strive. I mean, if you're, whatever vocation you have uh, with your family or your job or whatever, you never want to say, I have finally reached the pinnacle, I am done. Like, you're always, every day, striving to become better and better and better. Well, and then and the next verse, to, too, well, you say the next verse talks about, like, what's, what's the point? So like, no one is established by wickedness. So when we yeah. say a good man obtains favor from the Lord, of course, the only one and true good man is Jesus. But aren't we, as you pointed out, imitating Paul as he imitates Christ in that meme? But aren't we striving to imitate Christ, uh, Christ to be good people? And so that is what this is telling us to do. It's not saying you need to recognize that you're good enough to be accepted by God. It's just saying, mm-hmm. you know, be good. It's Jesus saying, go and sin no more. And, and yeah. you obtain favor from the Lord, um, but a man of evil devices he condemns, and he will. But then three really drives it home because instead of saying that, like, the wicked never prosper because they do prosper all the time, it just says no one is established by wickedness. I mean, if we're talking about yeah. – if we're thinking forward to judgment, then they're not – they cannot be established. They can't be firm. They can't be secure in their wickedness because, well, when judgment comes, they're going to be, you know, wiped away. But the root of the righteous, now that is what is a good foundation. Yeah. The, I thought of, I think about this all the time, established by wickedness, wickedness. And what I found, and it's true, it never leads to security, peace of mind, or contentment. I mean, just think of all in the past not to get overly political, five years of this being very the case, right? Something comes out and then someone's life is like, oh, look, like that didn't last long, but they hit it for a while. I feel like it always, sin's always going to come to the surface at some point. You can, you can repress it, but if you've got, you know, skeletons in your closet, they tend to find their way out. I mean, it's Satan establishing you. Satan's going to watch you fall and laugh at some point. He doesn't have any issues against that. And that's the whole point, and we'll get to it more later, too, but the root of righteousness will never be moved. It's, it's the whole thing of, who cares if you're happy? Like, let's be people who are content where we're at. Like, it's the, the root is obviously Christ, and where do we find contentment? It isn't from the world. It isn't by being established in 
ourselves, but being established in the one thing that will hold secure. It'll come up again, but in Proverbs 16, it says, uh, the, uh, the heart of a man plans his way, but Yahweh establishes his steps. So there's this context that in righteousness, you're basically not m- being motivated by your own sinful desires, but you're being motivated by what God wants you to do. And so you can make all the plans you want, but righteousness will cause us to always choose or strive to choose God's will over our own desires. But you know, I think about giving into wickedness, and what is that? As you said already earlier, it's giving into the, the sin of making yourself God. And so I just want to do whatever I want to do, and it has no foundation, and, um, and and it's being warned against here. Now, as we move into Proverbs 4, the tone shifts a little bit. In fact, it's kind of a, a little bit of a preview to Proverbs 31. Uh, verse 4 says, An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who brings shame is like rottenness in his bones. And then it goes on to talk about the thoughts of the righteous and the counsels of the wicked, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so verse 4 seems a little out of per- place, but this term, an excellent wife or a, a woman of strength, uh, literally from the Hebrews, it's how they described Ruth, for instance. Um, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who brings shame is like rottenness in his bones. Uh, there really is something to the biblical teaching that, Husband and wife become one flesh. You, you know, you just as you can mutually complement each other, um, and I would say this goes both ways. You can also be ruinous to one another. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the two shall become one, and we actually, you know, believe that. That's a thing. If, and right. your job as a spouse to take care of your spouse, not you. Like my 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 job as husband is not to be worried about me. It's to be worried about my family, my wife, and my kids. It's not about me. Just like my wife takes care of me, and that's absolutely true. I mean, she'll probably be annoyed, but like she's the greatest wife in the world. Because every husband should think that they are the crown. They're the thing we show up. Like, look at my wife. Like, look how awesome she is. Like that's that's the greatest thing you can have. And then if it's, your wife isn't that way or your husband, whatever way it is, if it is shame, and then it is like you're withering away quite literally. Yeah, we've been in the position, or at least I know I have, I assume you might have too, to counsel folks, let's just put it out of there, whose, whose marriages aren't going well. And in, in those cases, it's very rare, of course, because we're all sinners, that – one could point to one spouse or the other and say, okay, you know, it, it's, your, it, it's your shame that's brought rottenness to your husband's bones or vice versa. <laughs> I yeah. mean, may, maybe sometimes it seems a little more evident, but, you know, we're, we never have all the information in our position, so we really can't ever say even if we could. But the point is, I think this speaks both practically on, on the ground and it speaks, of course, spiritually, as all the Psalms seem to be doing. So on the ground, if you think of the father talking to his son, then it is an emphasis that you must find a strong woman, a woman who's founded, one who's established in righteousness. Like, like what have I been talking about, right? You know, you need to find a woman uh, who is going to be – you're going to wear her like a crown uh, in in this metaphorical sense. Um, And and what do crowns do? Well, they – they, they illustrate authority, but they illustrate your responsibility. They illustrate, you know, it's, it's really a beautiful depiction. And, of course, we know it talks about Christ and his church ultimately. But, but still, you need to find someone. And, I, and while it's, it's phrased here about wives, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's improper to say that this goes both ways. You know, to seek out husbands, to seek out wives, to seek out a spouse who is established so that they can be your crown, so that they can be um, – um, your, your shining glory, so to speak, uh, and, and to avoid those who are wicked because they will, even if you're faithful, this really goes to the don't be unequally yoked. At the yeah. same time, I think this applies to our faith too, right? So, so yeah, you know, yeah. if, we, if, if the bride is the church and the, and the groom is, the, is Christ, then I think we yeah. also have a duty to make sure that our faith expressions are also faithful and established. Yeah. No, it's so true. 
because, I mean, you got Jesus showing up to Saul, right? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Like, why are you persecuting my bride? We are Christ's bride. And oddly enough, he wants to show us off. <laughs> it's, a, it's such a foreign thing that we're, I think we're used to in Lutheranism, that Christ looks on you and actually smiles and is and proud of you when you're doing what you should be doing. Like, go, go do the things that you were put here to do. That's uh, not as complicated as everyone thinks it is. Be faithful in your vocation. Do the best job you possibly can raising your kids. Do the best job you can. Whatever station in your life you are, you are here yet to be about the work for your neighbors, whatever that looks like. So just one more before we head to break. The thoughts of the righteous are just. The counsels of the wicked are deceitful. Uh, maybe one more. The words of the wicked lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright delivers them. So we see a little bit, and I don't know if it is technically, but we see a little bit of parallelism here. So the thoughts of the righteous are just, and then if you go all the way to the bottom, but the mouth of the upright delivers them. And in the middle, the counsels of the wicked are deceitful. The words of the wicked lie in wait for blood. So yet again, it seems pretty simple and self-explanatory on the surface here. Um, I think of Matthew 12. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. Well, it's the same here. We we're talking about the thoughts of righteous are just, but the counsels, that is the things that they say, the wicked, are deceitful. The words of the wicked lie in wait for blood, but then the words, that is the counsels of the upright, deliver them. So we see here that um, an emphasis on, I guess, thought, word, and deed, I, I would say. Yeah. You know, I think that's the emphasis here. It's not just what you actually do, but even the things you say and the things you think can be uh, either righteous or sinful. Yeah, the, so the thing I found really interesting with this is when I was reading a commentary, it said six is explaining why five is true. The counsels of the wicked are deceitful because the words of the wicked are in ambush waiting for blood, which I really like ambush better because it's like you think of a predator, mm -hmm. right? Just sitting there waiting, waiting. And a moment of opportunity is they go for it. And then why are they deceitful? Because they're, they're not looking out for you. I can tell you that much. They're looking for blood, and they're going to get it. Yeah, I Proverbs one one says, or sorry, one eleven. Pardon me. Says, if they say, "Come with us, let us lie and wait for blood, let us ambush the innocent without reason," et cetera, et cetera. We probably recall that little uh, monograph from the father to the son about why not to hang out with these people, and and here yeah. it is reinforced because you know it's. It, your, your sinfulness is expressed not just in the things that you do, but even in these more deeper ways. And so, A, you don't want to be that guy. B, you don't want to hang out with that guy. And if we yeah. take the verse before it, you don't want to marry that guy. So <laughs> yeah. it's, it, 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 I know it seems simplistic. And, and honestly, like the scripture often does, it reinforces the same ideas over and over. But, but how often do we find ourselves drawn to the wrong people? <laughs> or drawn yeah. to to be the wrong people. Uh, so really, it is a message that we have to keep listening to over and over again. Well, we are right up here against a break, so we're going to take it. But folks, don't go anywhere. When we come back from these messages, uh, Pastor Baker and I will keep on going. We'll pick up with Proverbs chapter 12, verse 7. See you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan316.
Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today is the Reverend Jesse Baker, pastor of Family of Christ Lutheran Church in Holton, Wisconsin. Don't forget, friends, you can contact me at pastorboo at gmail.com or on Facebook or by phone with your comments, questions, and more. That phone is 1-800-730-2727. All right, let's head back to the text. So we left off. Uh, oh, let's see here. Here we go. We we left off with talking about how we sin both in thought, word, and deed. Uh, verse 7. The wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous will stand. A man is commended according to his good sense, but one of twisted mind is despised. All right. So two more Proverbs. The wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous will stand. Well, we know from experience that this isn't always the case this side of Christ's return. So I have a feeling this is talking and pointing us more forward to this reality that even when you see the, the wicked so-called prospering in this world, that there is a time when their house will not be established and will not stand. Yeah, I think as Christians especially, we need to have the view of eternity far more often than what we do, because the wicked are going to be overthrown, and no more, really shortly. I guess this isn't something in the far-off future, but when Christ returns, the whole existence of our time here, this side of eternity, is but a blink compared to what we have looking forward to us. Like, 80 years, 100 years, however long we live, lasts. It's nothing compared to what's coming. So yeah, the wicked... Their, their time's coming to an end. The snake's head cut off. I mean, this isn't forever. This is what makes eternity so exciting, is an existence without then death or the devil anymore. What does that even look like? I say all the time, I don't know. If you, if you do write a book and pitch it to CPH, you might make two <laughs> bucks on it. But, I mean, seriously, exactly. what is, we, we have no idea. I would say it this way. Like, we don't. Jesus was born perfect, right? We literally had a perfect two-year-old on earth and no one figured it out. <laughs> like we are, yeah. I, my son's a, a 14 months, so I'm, I'm starting to get used to the reality of two-year-olds are a handful. Oh, sure. And I was when I was younger. But seriously, like, we are so corrupted by sin that we couldn't figure that out, and that's just always wild to me. And that's what makes the next verse so important. Like, the house of the righteous will stand. Which, if you've ever been in Sunday school. You probably always think of the song, like, you know, the house is built upon the rock. I'm not going to sing and belabor you guys in Lutheran <laughs> purgatory, but, like, that's what it is. Well, Jesus has a whole parable on this. On, what's the foundation on? Is it built on Christ? Because guess what? Then your foundation's fine, and the problem isn't ever going to be the foundation. And what I think is fascinating, too, is the, the passive language. The wicked mm-hmm. are overthrown. And are no more. The house of the righteous will stand. Um, yeah. At least this idea that the, the – well, the house of the righteous will stand isn't necessarily passive. But, but the fact is the wicked are overthrown. Who's doing the work? God. One day God will come and overthrow the wicked. Job 34 says, thus knowing their works, he overturns them in the night and they are crushed. And that's what God will do at the end to all those who are wicked, including us if we don't have a relationship with Jesus. right? So if we reject that free gift of faith. Yeah. If we follow after the world, if we make these decisions to go after Lady Folly rather than Lady Wisdom, then we're going to find that we're no longer going to be established, right? Yeah. We don't believe in once saved, always saved. Nothing can separate us from the love that God has for us in Christ, but we separate ourselves from that love all the time. So this is another yeah. reminder that the wicked will be overthrown, but the house of the righteous will stand, and we already know that that house is built um, on Christ, and that's the one that will stand. A man is commended according to his good sense, but one of twisted mind is despised. That word twisted is the same word that we used for crooked uh, earlier when we talked about crooked paths. Uh, twisted, bent, disformed, warped mind. Um, I, I think that takes us back also to this understanding that that the way in which um, – well, I don't know. Let me ask you. Do you think that this is indicative of the fact that some people are just – I don't want – all people are called to be saved. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. But, but I'm thinking about the reality that there are people whose hearts are so hardened, 
whose minds are so twisted that I, I, you never want to say there's not hope, but you get what I'm, you get the sentiment I'm talking yeah. about. Well, you, you go to Pharaoh, right? That's the easy one. And God hardened his heart. Yeah, what do you do with that? Like, God, God is controlling all things, and is at some point God actually going to come and say, you're getting judgment now. Right. Like, I'm, right. I'm going to judge you now. That, that's a terrifying thought. He, he could do it. Why can't he? He's God. But it's a real thing that we have to be worried about. Like, yeah, you can't just play games with God. You don't get to be cute and go, well, I'll wait till later in life. I'll have my fun now, which isn't actually fun. It's just depravity and death. I'll do that now, and later I'll... Who, who, who decides you get a later? Like, how, how do you know you're not going to... Jesus is going to say, no, we're done. That's right. Just, just you're a fool. Tonight your soul's required of you. Right, you don't know. Exactly. Yeah. So that's I mean, cause, always the thing we've got to watch out for. It's not that they can't be safe, but at what point is, is God just going to say, we're done? He does right. this and I mean, look at, look at Judges, right? That's the whole book. And kings almost like, they're like, hey, God, like, everything's terrible again. Save us. He's like, okay, I'll do that. And then life's good for a while. And they start being depraved again. And God sends some army against them. He's judging them. He's like, we're, we're done doing this, guys. Stop it. Well, and we hear elsewhere in the scriptures that, you know, if, if you're not following in the ways of God, you stand judged already. So you say, well, everybody should have the sort of this second chance. Well, everybody is constantly has the chance. But because you don't know when your life's required of you, yeah, if you haven't repented today, then you stand in judgment. You know, this yeah. is why we live our lives constantly reflecting on the reality that we are sinners and then rejoicing in the reality that we are saved by Christ's blood and that the faith that he has given us in that sacrifice saves us so that we can be established, so that we know that our house will stand forever. But at the same time, for those who have uh, departed the faith, those who have rejected Christ, those who make no use of his gifts, those who don't, frankly, believe anymore, then you're standing condemned. And 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 you, we, we don't want that as Christians, yeah. uh, and God doesn't want that either. Uh, but that's how you twist up one's own mind. So, it, yeah, it's I think it's a, it's a tough conversation because we also recognize that people are easily deceived, ourselves included. Mm -hmm. So when we go out into the world and we see all these people and they're fighting for things like like um, the ability to murder children in the womb, when they're fighting for things against the family, when they're fighting for laws to recognize things that are against science and nature, when, when they're fighting for things um, like easier divorces and when they're fighting for things that just are contrary to God's will, it's easy to think, Look at all these enemies of God. These are the wicked. They're going to be overthrown and are no more, and I'm, and I'm looking forward to that day. But that's yeah. not what God wants us to do. This is about us. This is about the choices yeah. we make. As far as them, then our only duty to them is not to treat them as enemy combatants, but to go out in mercy <laughs> and tell them that there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's freedom from what they're – they are deceived. And, and yeah. I guess I just struggle personally because sometimes I fall into that error of looking at mm -hmm. the enemies of God as my enemies. But yeah. I, I don't know that that's always the best. The imprecatory Psalms aside, as another guest brought it up, those aside, because I think that had a lot more to do with warfare, um, mm -hmm. I, I, we're, we're here to call these people to repentance, and we do that out of love. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, that's the thing. Like, how, how can you, a forgiven child of God, withhold forgiveness from them? Who say right. we are, you weren't as lost? We weren't as lost as one point before we're baptized. Well, of course they're going to act that way. They're they're of the world. What do you expect them to act like? Like righteous pagans? Really? You you expect that? I don't. I mean, these these are the people who need Christ, and we need to be going to them. And when they come into our building, it's what Jesus says, right? I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. Right. I mean, it's not that we want. A little leaven, yeah, ruins the whole bread, but at the same time, who are we supposed to go out to reach? The people who need Christ, people who don't have their identity in him. and Those are the people we're to go to. We don't hide in the quarter and sing kumbaya. It's not what we do. Anyway, like, do that. That's not what we're supposed to be doing, though. <laughs> well, I think the next verse speaks to that because the next verse talks about, the next proverb, it talks about humility, being being humble. Um, it's better to live humbly uh but comfortably than to make some sort of superficial show of wealth 
But I think it's more than wealth. I think it's also just any sort of elitism. Let's read it. That's going to be uh, Proverb 9. Better be lowly and have a servant than to play the great man and lack bread. Um, a little confusing. Uh, I, I've seen variants uh, that it says better to be lowly and be a servant than to play the great man and lack bread. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't think it really matters in terms of meaning. But how do you take this passage? Yeah, I go. I honestly thought of the wedding feast. Right, you show up to the wedding feast that Christ talks about it. What are you? Are you going to take the place of honor? Or are you going to take the place where you? That's lowly. Yeah, that's what it is. It's a, it's a humility thing. This is where it's unsurprising. I'm going to quote C.S. Lewis. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but of yourself less. Yeah, I like I mean, that. It's so good because who are you? This is the thing that I would say. Why would you ever think less of yourself? You're you're a prince or a princess of Jesus, right? Like seriously. He's the king of kings, lords of lords, and you're his child. You're not some whoever off the streets. You're a child of God. You are the treasured possession of his eyes. You, this is going to sound crazy, too. You kind of are a big deal <laughs> to God. You are, absolutely. So don't think less of yourself, but think of yourself less often. So it's not about puffing yourself up and showing yourself off like, look, I am the greatest person, but you don't have anything of such thing. People are, are uh, you know, thinking of this practically too. People are, are able to spend their money however they wish, and they can have their priorities however they wish. Um, but growing up down south, uh, I lived myself, uh, but also around some pretty poor areas of the south. And sometimes you would see people living in pretty dilapidated homes or mobile homes, and they would be very uh, just not in good repair. Uh, but then sitting outside would be like a Corvette, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and, <laughs> yep. and, and again, people can spend their money however they wish. I don't, I don't really care. But my point is uh, sometimes people do those kinds of things because while people won't come to their home, they will see them driving around in that nice car. And, and so yeah. th there's a temptation for us and we all do it. I believe we all do it or we're all tempted yeah. to do it. There's a temptation for us to kind of put on airs. Um, and, and, and what what it means to be to play the great man is different for different people. It's like for uh, for some people, it might be uh, money. They want to they want people to think that they're wealthier than they are. Well, they really actually lack bread at home. For some people, they want yeah. them to think they're more religious than they really are and yet are actually impoverished yeah. or more intelligent or more educated. There's so many ways that we kind of put on airs um, to be lowly, to be humble. To be a servant, or frankly, even to have a servant, but be, but, but be a humble master. It, it, the idea here is that honesty is going to get us farther or further with people when we go to witness to them. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, this is the church's, I guess, great sin in general, at least in America, is for a long time, and, and the church continues to have this reputation, of people who think that they're better than you, that they're holier yeah. than thou. Um, that's why I really push hard against this making unbelievers our enemies language because I just don't think yeah. it's fair because that's that's what people think of the church. They think that there's a bunch of hypocrites and there are a bunch of people who are really sinners but think they're better than everybody else. Whereas I think the, the Lutheran approach, at least the way it's supposed to be, is that we readily acknowledge that we're poor, miserable sinners. Uh, heck, we start almost every service with it. Um, and, and I think that, <laughs> yeah. should be, that should be part of our witness too, though. To say, hey, listen, I'm not saying I'm better than you. I'm saying I'm currently better off, and I want you to join me. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah. I also see that here, both the practicality of don't walk around being a jerk with your fake Rolex or whatever, but at the same time, um, don't be, don't pretend to be something you're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's the witness we get constantly from you know the apostles and obviously Jesus is, you know, Paul isn't grandstanding every time he shows up somewhere, right? Like, look at me! And when he says, I'm the least of the apostles, <laughs> he actually means it. <laughs> like, he, he thinks he's the lowest. And that's the attitude we're supposed to have. I mean, think what he actually did. He, he's not, he's well aware of what he did. He's well all the more aware of the forgiveness 
that he has in Christ. I think that's something we, as many of us Lutherans, are baptized as babies. And I mean, praise be to God, we didn't have to go do all those things. But I think sometimes we we do have cheap grace because we've been in here so long. We know nothing but it, and we just take it for granted. Where you're outside the faith and you come in, you're like, why why did you why didn't you guys tell me this before? Like my life is so much better now because of this, and grace is so amazing, mercy is so amazing. Why would you keep me from it? And I think a lot of us are just so inundated by it. We have it so much. And I say this all the time. Whenever Jesus talks, it probably should shock you because he's saying something pretty wild pretty consistently. But we've heard it so much, we're just kind of almost licentious with it. We're like, eh, yeah, he said that. Right, right. Well, this next passage takes us to animals. <laughs> you know, uh, people, <laughs> people love their animals. People love their pets. Um, I think it was Mahatma Gandhi who said, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. Of course, you know, he was a a, a vegan pagan, but still, you know, treating (laughs) animals is a good thing. Uh, Paul McCartney, uh, well, I won't say if he's a vegan pagan, but I will say that he had a quote. He had a quote that said, you can judge a man's true character by the way he treats his fellow animals, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, There's lots of quotes. I looked them up. I have a whole list of them here. But the point is, the Bible says this too. Verse 10, whoever is righteous and has regard for the life of his beast, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. The word beast here is talking about like a domesticated animal. It can be used for cattle and stuff like that. And it might also be talking about that. But basically, not wild beasts, not bears that are trying to kill you, but uh, <laughs> but your animals, your livestock, even your little dogs and cats. But the mercy of the wicked is cruel. Now, that seems interesting. It's like even when the wicked is trying to be merciful or compassionate, it still ends up being cruel in the context of animals. Yeah. Just an interesting proverb. Yeah. Well, it's kind of the thing of things that you think less than yourself. Because the animals are below us. We're here to tend them, right? That's part of the garden. Take care of the animals. So what do you think of something that's less than you? How do you treat it? You're going to use and abuse it? Like, you know, you have to you used to have to have horses pull to, so you could provide from the farm. You used to have oxen do the same thing sheep too like what are you going to do you're just going to sit there and beat them if they're being annoying or are you actually going to take care of them properly the funny thing enough as someone who likes eating meat a lot the animals are taking care of better they actually do taste better that's a real thing so you know interesting well i mean that makes sense though right yeah well well, there's a certain breed i'm pretty sure this is don't fact check me some of the wagyu (laughs) beef in uh (laughs) in japan they massage the cows like i've heard that yeah yeah, so I mean, I'm not saying we need to go out there and massage our heads all the time, but <laughs> well, you well, know, we'll wag- do. Isn't that isn't that like oh. uh, like eighty bucks an ounce or something like that? So oh yeah, easy. <laughs> but there's something to that. Are you taking care of God's creation? Are right, you right. are you do you actually love it? Because He put it here for you to find delight in, or are you just even if your mercy is cruel? Like yeah, you guys can take a break for two seconds. Break over. Well, okay. So take care I, I want to talk about this very practically. Um, you know, so we think of hunters, and there are mm-hmm. unscrupulous hunters, but the vast majority of hunters that I know um, are very much um, conservationists as well. Uh, yeah, they, 100%, they, yeah. Yeah, they, 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 now listen, I actually am not a big fan of hunting, either personally or otherwise. I just, not my, not my bag. Uh, but I certainly don't yeah. judge anybody that does it. But I do know that those who do hunt, they they absolutely they most of them I know are very very responsible hunters, and they want they really want to care for creation and also provide for their family and et cetera et cetera. Um, but then you think of somebody like Peta who puts on airs about wanting to protect animals, and you can fact check me on this, but they uh, put to sleep uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of animals. Um, all the time. I mean, th- you should see the lists that are available. So my point is, even in their mercy, they're just sort of wiping out animals so that no one can abuse them. Whereas others who might take the life of an animal in a responsible way are actually <laughs> being more compassionate. Um, yeah, and, and, it, it, and so, yeah, and if you choose to like be a vegetarian or vegan, trust me, I'm, I'm not mocking that. Uh, but it is important, though, that we recognize that 
whether or not you consume animals or use animal products, whether you do or you don't, I think everybody should agree that we should treat animals with kindness. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we've been given dominion over them. Yeah. And this is the big thing we've really changed as a society. I feel like, too, of slaughterhouses are way more humane than what they used to be and do such a better job of processing the animals. And hunters is such a good point because every time a hunter misses and doesn't essentially get an instant kill on the animal, they, like, beat themselves up about it. They're like, oh, I should have had a better shot. I should have been able to, I should have been able to take care of that better. I've and heard of guys tracking them for a long time to, in hopes of, yeah. you know, putting them out of their misery. Yeah. So we're not here to be using, abusing these, but they're here for us to, like I said before, find delight and take care of, you know, God gave us these things intentionally and by no accident that they taste good, in my opinion. I like that. I like it. Well, let's move on because we have a few more left in just a few minutes, unfortunately. Uh, We're turning from hunters to farmers now. Verse 11, whoever works his land will have plenty of bread. But he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. Uh, I know the farmers in my congregation would like that. (laughs) But in in the context of the time in which it was written, uh, everybody, for the most part, pretty much had some land to work. It was an agrarian society. And so this is really, again, talking about laziness. So if you're avoiding the essentials to go off after worthless pursuits, well, (laughs) you lack sense. And it doesn't say it, but you're also going to lack some bread, too. Yeah. Yeah, it's a vocation thing. Like, you are, you are here, go do those instead of pining for something else. Like, you're not here to, there's no rich quick scheme. There's no clever thing that you're going to come up with, which is actually normally not a good thing in the Bible, being clever. Like, do your job and do it well. Absolutely. Sometimes I feel like, you know, I, I, I think we've all, no matter what our vocation is, have been in situations where we kind of procrastinate and maybe we start thinking, well, maybe I want to go do this or I get interested in that. And you start doing that to the to the um, detriment of your other vocations like family and work or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, p- p- pursuits that are, are, are beneficial might be just relaxing and don't serve any other purpose. But here it's really talking about the lazy, the lackadaisical, the the man who is the brutish man who doesn't want to do anything. All right, I'm going to read the rest of the the last three of our selection for this morning, 12, 13, and 14. Whoever is wicked covets the spoil of evildoers, but the root of the righteous bears fruit. An evil man is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous escapes from trouble. From the fruit of his mouth, a man is satisfied with good, and the work of a man's hand comes back to him. So taking them just really quick one by one, whoever's wicked covets the spoil of evildoers. Um, yeah, I mean, people, when, if, if we follow after the ways of this world, who, who's impressive to this world? Who makes the covers of magazines? Typically yeah. the uber wealthy. Um, every now and then you might get a good, good uh, do-gooder like Mother Teresa. But for the mm-hmm. most part, people aspire to be uh, the, the, the super wealthy, the Elon Musks, the – the, the Zuckerbergs, the whoever, you know, you might want to name um, those people. They may not want to be them, but they certainly want to have access to their resources. They they covet yeah. the spoils <laughs> of evildoers. By the way, I'm not saying those people are evildoers, by the way. I'm just saying in general, um, people mm-hmm. don't celebrate righteousness. They celebrate yeah. uh, worldly things. Yeah. It's like there's a reason there's two commandments against covetedness. Oh, right. Covetousness and that's and, or, or the gift of contentment. Right. And that's exactly what yeah. it's talking about. Now, the evil man is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous escapes from trouble again in an, an eternal sense. That's probably I would go. Absolutely. Yeah, we escape from the trouble that should be ours. That's the beauty of it is we, we deserve hell. At least I do. I definitely yeah. deserve it. But that's the beauty of Christ is we get escape from that reality. You know, and it talks about the transgression of his lips and snaring him. I think it's just this reality that foolish or sinful speech is ultimately going to come back and, and harm you, the speaker. I mean, if you tell lies, people will quit trusting you. If you if you aren't if you don't keep your word, people will quit relying on you. 
if you talk bad about people, then people won't share things with you. <laughs> they won't, you, 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 you trap yourself up also. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, from the fruit of the mouth or his mouth, a man is satisfied with good and the work of a man's hands come back to him. That one's a little interesting because, you know, it's it's almost like karma, this idea that that a work of a man's hands come back to him. Like, you know, the universe is somehow going to uh, give you good if you do good. That's not exactly how God works. Instead here, yeah. I, I like I see it more as. Um, um, not in a karma kind of way, but just in a when you do good to others, in contrast to the man who's been ensnared by his transgressing lips, then people are going to trust you and be with you more, and 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 you know, and good things are going to happen back to you usually. Yeah, you reap what you sow. If you plant good seed, you'll get right good crops. You plant bad seed, you get bad crops. Because the whole point of it is comes back to the the whole thing of Proverbs. What does it mean to be wise? This is what it looks like. I mean, the whole thing is constantly driving surrender and form to Christ because he is the truth. And life's going to be a lot better if he's God and you're not. Well, I think that's where we're going to have to end it, I'm afraid, because we're right here up against time. But you know what? I like that thought, right? He's God, you're not. That is essentially the message of Proverbs. You know, (laughs) he's given us the way to live. Don't follow after our own desires and our own wickedness, but walk in the ways of the Lord. Um, and I think that's a good message. I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Jesse Baker, pastor of Family of Christ Lutheran Church in Holton, Wisconsin. Pastor, once again, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me again. Folks, tomorrow the Reverend Steve Tice will be on to help us wrap up Chapter 12 with uh, verses 15 through 28. Uh, but that will be tomorrow, same time, same place. Until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all. As we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.